So we're going to start our second session of the uh, meeting. Uh, first thing I want to thank you, it's our sponsor today, uh, Okta. Uh, unfortunately, they were not able to make it uh, on site today because I think they got stuck in traffic or something like that. But anyways, I just want to <laughs> make sure that they get the uh, appreciation from us and um, we'll move on to our next topic. The next speaker is uh, uh, a gentleman from G Digital and he's going to share with us some of the amazing things that he's doing for the manufacturing process. So one thing that's going to be interesting is he's not going to be talking about um, you know, the startup, how startup use technology. He's going to show a real world example of how a, a very established company and really try to reinvent themselves going through a, uh, a digital transformation. So for that, I'd like to invite um, Bill Dorothy from um, GE Digital. Is this working? Yep. Yeah, yeah. If you can hear me. All right. So William Doherty with GE Digital. Um, I am a cloud architect. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my parents don't know what I do. My wife doesn't know what I do. But now everybody here thinks it's the coolest job in the world. So. Um, yeah, so what we're going to do here today, it was interesting. I came down here, and, you know, I'm normally talking to people who run oil rigs, run power plants, run electric grids, you know, run oil, oil refineries. So kind of coming here, I was like, oh my gosh, this audience, like there's going to be almost no overlap, right? They're not going to know what I'm talking about. So it's kind of funny. The first couple of speakers came out, right? I mean, I got that plug for being a cloud architect, but then they were talking about hybrid data centers. They were talking about on-prem. You know, they were even talking about putting stuff on oil rigs. So I was like, oh, wait a second. There is kind of a lot of synergy here. So I think what I'll do is I'll talk to you guys about the transformation GE's making and then also how we see the world. So there's going to be a lot of stuff in there. I'll try not to make it too, too vague. I know there's a lot of terms out there, but I'll be talking about digital transformation. IoT plays a big role in this and also cloud and SaaS. So that's kind of the journey we're going to take. Um, I want to start out with kind of talking or showing a video that shows a little bit about where GE's at right now. So I think we'll play this video first. Proud of your son, GE, manufacturer. Well, that's why I dug this out for you. It's your grandpappy's hammer, and he would have wanted you to have it. It meant a lot to him. Yes, GE makes powerful machines, but I'll be writing the code that will allow those machines to share information with each other. I'll be changing the way the world. You can't pick it up, can you? Go ahead. He can't lift the hammer. It's OK, though. You're going to change the world. Yeah, so I mean, that, that ad's pretty funny, but it's, it's pretty real. I mean, that's the world we live in, right? I mean, you get someone new who's a cloud architect, and you send them out there to an oil refinery. I mean, that's, that's exactly the people who are sitting at that table, right? There's just very different worlds. So trying to merge these two worlds is it's pretty interesting. So I'll kind of show you guys this slide here. And the first time I kind of saw it, I was like, whoa, that's really strange, right? So these are the biggest companies by market cap, so how much they're valued at, right? So 2001, GE is number one spot, right? And I think like 2001, I mean, that, that just looks like any town in America, right? Like you got General Electric, they supply the electricity to the houses and the refrigerators, right? Everyone knows what that is, right? Everyone who's got a PC that uses Microsoft Outlook, right? They all know about that. They've all had to buy Word 15 times, right? Then you got the local gas station, Exxon, you got the local bank, and then you got the local store, right? That's what you got. Looks like every town in America. It's perfect. Everyone loves that. You know, 2006, it's all pretty much the same. You know, you get two gas stations, but you still got GE, you still got Microsoft, you still got a bank, right? 2011, oil hits 110 bucks a barrel. You get a bunch of oil companies in there. But things are still pretty similar. Look what's happened now. Biggest companies by market cap. What would you guys consider those? Are those software companies? What do you think? Are they software companies? Are they technology companies? Are they what are they? Like what, what's similar between all those companies? Data? Platform? Yeah, so I think I mean I'd say if there is a commonality among these, right? Other than the fact that I think they're all on the west coast of the US, right? I think the commonality there is that they probably all run really big data centers, right? And use those big data centers to help them 
run products, right? So I mean, Apple, really, I mean, they make all their money selling you devices. Sony has devices, GE has devices, right? Lots of people make devices that aren't in this list. So really, I mean, they sell you phones, that's how they make all their profit, right? Phones and computers, but they use computers and data centers behind that to make those products better. So Alphabet, Google, like they don't sell software to you. You don't buy Google software, right? What Google does is they're basically uh, yellow pages. They just use technology and data centers to make that yellow pages better. When I'm looking for a plumber, I get a list of all the plumbers and then I get these big full page ads for the plumbers who pay for them. They make their money the same way the yellow pages did. It's just a different model. They use computers to help do it. Microsoft, yeah, they sell you software licenses, right? They're the same. Amazon, right? I mean, really the reason they have this thing? They just went out to a, a Walmart type store, and used computers and data centers to make that experience better. They're a retailer, right? I mean, they're not selling you software, they're a retailer. And then Facebook, I mean, I consider them a media company. I mean, I used to get media, you know, if I had to find out the news of the world, what I used to do is I got, you know, I got the Wall Street Journal to find out the news. I subscribed to a ski magazine, a bicycle magazine, People, or Us Weekly, right? I would get that stuff, and then for the rest of my news, I had to go to a soccer game on the weekend and say, oh, what are Joni and Freddie doing? Oh, what's Ricky's kid doing? Right? I had to find out what was happening in the news. So what ended up happening is Facebook says, well, let's get that newspaper, let's get the magazines, and then let's get all that social gossip that people like, let's put it all into one window and deliver it. Let's get rid of the newspaper, let's get rid of all the magazines, let's get rid of all the need to go down to the local bar to find out what's happening in your neighborhood with all the people and the gossip. Let's put it all on one platform and then charge advertisers the same way the Wall Street Journal does and People Magazine does. I mean, they're basically just a media company. They just change the way we get media, right? And they sell advertising. So I think the interesting thing here is the world has changed and these people who have these huge data centers with, literally, I mean, I think all these companies have in excess of a million computers sitting in their data centers. They're changing the world. And the fact is, once they do that, you can't catch up. So by the time you realize they're at your doorstep, they just swallow industries overnight. So what happens is GE is looking at this and saying, holy cow, like we used to be number one, right? Are we in trouble? What's gonna happen, right? So let's go to, oh, I think I control the next slide. All right, so who is GE? Everyone know who GE is? General Electric? So we are the only company that was on the original Dow Jones Industrial Average who's still on it. So 125 years, right? So the only, we're the last survivor of the original founding fathers, right? So we've been around a long, long time. When we started, we were making hydro dams, airplane engines, electric grids, all that stuff, right? We've kind of merged over the years, but basically that's what we do. We make airplane engines. We make the best airplane engines in the world, right? That division, $22 billion. Right, we make MRIs and CAT scanners, right? That's the ones. We're the world's number one maker of locomotives, the ones that carry the, the guys in the front of the train, not all the stuff on the back of the train, the people in the front of the train. We make those wind turbines, right? So we make big pieces of equipment. That's what we make, that's what we sell. So now the question is, that's who we are. So the next question is, can we change? I mean, is a company that has been around that long, who has been this established, making these big assets, can we actually compete with those other companies? Can we change? That's a big question, right? Still hasn't been answered, right? But that is a big question. So there is some stuff here that kind of lets us know that the reason why we have been on that list for all of those years is because we have been able to change, right? And we've done it a couple times in our past. Um, does anyone here know, is the electric grid that we use AC or DC? It's AC electric grid. GE, when we started, we came out with the DC electric grid. Our first big product was the wrong one. <laughs> we pushed it. We pushed it for a couple of years, right? And eventually we were just like, oh my God, the technology is wrong. Like this is not, like people are dying, like plugging in their fridge, like we're in trouble. <laughs> so basically we went out. This was called Edison Electric. And since you have gone this way, so now. Yes, you're right. <laughs> so basically we started out with the wrong thing. We were able to pivot off that. We ended up Tesla and Westinghouse did the AC grid. We kind of morphed in there and just were kind of a little savvier business-wise and kind of took that over. A couple other times, has anyone here seen that movie, The Graduate? Remember there's that phrase in there, son, get into plastics, right? The same way it's like cloud architects, right? If you got in the, right? Right around that time, it was getting to plastics. So the same thing happened. 
plastics came out, and really it was like rayon, nylon, all of these things were created, and GE sat there at the same time in the 60s and 70s. They were like, holy cow, like, what if someone comes out with this new plastic that's half the weight of steel, stronger than steel, has better heat properties than steel, right? And then they own a patent on it, and then they start making airplane engines out of this. We're out of business tomorrow, right? We can't compete. So they said, oh my God, we have to get out ahead of this because these people are making new plastics every week. So what ended up happening is we said, okay, we've got to, instead of hiding, we've got to embrace this. Has anyone here ever heard of Jack Welsh? Anyone know who he is? Yeah, so Jack Welsh was our CEO. Does anyone know what his schooling was? PhD in plastics. I mean, this guy was a chemical engineer, and he got hired in at that time to go outside of everything and said, you guys have to figure out what is the next plastic product that's better than steel, right? Go find it out. And we built all these plastic companies and everything else, and eventually we figured out what plastic's good at, right? We still use a ton of plastic, right? It's not, it's not, it, we never had that wonder breakthrough that made metal obsolete, right? But we did have a lot of plastics out there, and then eventually we said, okay, that's kind of now a commodity. We did sell that off. And then what happened after that is GE went through and said, well, the next thing that happened, do any ever read that book or see that movie Wall Street? There was a time where people came into the world and said, you know what? I'm gonna get three or four really smart, aggressive people in Manhattan. They're gonna go call up their friends who have a lot of money. They're gonna figure out exactly where public companies are vulnerable, and they're gonna buy just enough shares and board seats to actually take over companies. And they're not gonna ask permission. This is when the hostile takeover happened. These people figured out finance in a different way than anyone else did, and they would just go into public companies and do some financial maneuvering. They would take over the board, fire everyone, get the company, split it up, never ask the employees, never ask the board. They just did it. Made tons of money. At that time, GE was like, oh my gosh, is that gonna happen to us, right? And what happened was GE said, we have to get really good at finance. So then GE said, we're actually gonna start a finance division. So Jack Welsh said, okay, I'm now the head. <laughs> I'm gonna start a finance division. He dropped the PhD from his title. He dropped the chemical engineering stuff from his title, and he said, I'm now just the leader of this company. And GE built a finance division that eventually became 40% of our revenue, 60% of our profit. Half of our company was made money in finance, right? So I guess the is, can we change? In the past, we've seen these same kind of things where the army's at the gates. Instead of going in and hiding in the sand, GE just said, we're going to go into a space we have no expertise in and figure it out. So, historically, we have changed a couple of times. Can we do it again? We're still in the middle of this war. We'll figure it out. All right, so our past CEO, we just changed CEOs. So our past CEO says, okay, this is the future. This is where things are changing, right? He says, okay, now what do we want to do? He says, well, in this new thing, I want to create the same way Amazon is for retail, like a digital version of retail, and the same way as Facebook is to media, a digital version of media, right? I want to make a digital industrial. So I'm going to make us the digital version of an industrial company. And he said, okay, that's great. So the first thing I got to do is I got to make myself an industrial company. So I said, oh gosh, like GE has now become this huge conglomerate. They're like, all right, well, how do we make ourselves an industrial company? They say, we got to get rid of stuff. So basically we downsize finance. As I said, right around 2008, it was 40% of our revenue, 60% of our profit. Started selling all of that off. We used to actually, Anyone here ever shop at Mervyn's? I don't, is Mervyn's even around anymore? I'm kind of dating myself, right? But yeah, I mean, you used to get a Mervyn's credit card, right? Or a Macy's credit card. That was all backed by GE money, right? It has nothing to do with turbines or anything. Like, we were just deep in finance in all of these different places. So what ended up happening is we downsized finance. Some of the other stuff we did is said, we're really going to focus on industrial. Does everyone remember NBC, right? I think it's still around. So when, I don't know. I don't know if it's a part of Netflix now or something. I don't know. But yeah, the idea is we actually owned NBC. And the idea at that time was like NBC is media to the world. They had NBC, CNN, right? The idea, it's like if you're a big company like GE, you need to own the media who's telling people what's going on in the world. So you can put a good light on GE, right? It was like marketing. So we basically said we're going to sell off NBC. We're going to sell off our plastic division. We're going to sell off our appliances division, right? So basically we said we're going to get rid of everything that's not industrial. So he basically went through and just sold, like 40% of our company, just sold it off. And then he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start buying with that money companies that are industrial. So Alstom is like the GE of France. So basically we bought someone who makes things in France, right? Went through that. They also said, okay, what other stuff is happening digitally with technology? They said, well, 
there's all this 3D printing going on. Has anyone here heard of, thing, seen much of 3D printing? So really, a lot of people do 3D printing now for prototypes. They go through and they actually say, you know what, I need to prototype this new mouse I'm creating and they 3D print it, right? So what ends up happening is very few companies were actually making 3D parts that were structurally ready to go. So what happened is we said, you know what, we're not gonna just use 3D printing for prototypes, we've been doing that for a long time. We're gonna get in really heavy to actually making parts that are 3D printed. And when you actually make parts that are 3D printed, you can make parts that don't, you can't make any other way, right? So normally if I wanna drill a hole through a box, I have to drill a straight hole through the box, that's what the drill bit looks like. With a 3D printer, I can actually drill a hole that goes in, out, and zigzags through the box and goes out, right? You can't do that with a drill bit. There's no other way to do that. So what ended up happening is we make these really complex, really expensive components like airplane engine fuel nozzles, and we're now making them with 3D printing, stuff that used to be 42 <laughs> pieces to make that geometry, now we're making different geometries with one piece. So basically we've now bought, we spent a couple billion dollars figuring out how to do this. This is part of it. And the next part of it, and this is where I'm gonna kinda get in here, and I think this is what's gonna be relevant to people, is then we decided to focus on software. Really get good at using software. Has GE used software before? Yeah, we've always used software. I mean, Walmart before Amazon used software, right? I mean, they had incredible stuff for supply chain, right? They had great stuff for ERP. I mean, you can't say they weren't good at software, it's just they were just a whole order of magnitude different than what Amazon was doing, right? So they basically said, we don't just have to use software like we do, We've got to completely change our game there. So this was our view of the world for software, right? Coming from GE's perspective, this is our view of the world. There was three different ways people built software. There was the internet cloud consumer stuff. These guys were building things that had billions of users, right? So Facebook now is what, 1.2 billion users, 600 million active users, right? So at any given time, they can add 10 million users or lose 10 million users, and they don't even care. They're still drinking coffee in the coffee shop. They don't even care. Oh, we had 10 million more users. Oh, we lost 10 million users. They don't even care. It doesn't even show up, right? Billions of users, millions of computers, and thousands of people at their headquarters working on keeping these platforms up, right? These people can serve someone for 20 cents a year. I can make money serving someone for 20 cents a year, right? Just incredible scale and efficiency. Then there were people who were sourcing to the corporate IT work. And this is the big data centers that GE use, that Walmart use, that everyone else uses. And they actually had thousands of users, right, for ERP and CRM systems. You know, hundreds of computers in the local on-premise data centers, you know, and 100 people working in IT, right? This is the stuff that keeps the UCLA data centers going, right? All the people like Oracle, IBM, SAP, all of them were selling into this space. Then we had our little world over here where we connected to industrial machines. And we're a whole level smaller than any of these things. We actually had tens of you. You go into an oil refinery or a plant, right? You got 35 people looking at that system, keeping that oil refinery going, right? We've got 12 computers that are there. Now with VMware, it's five computers that are running 12 computers on them, right? And we have you know, a couple people who are supporting these systems. So we're just way smaller. So what happened, we kind of said, okay, there's these three groups. And for a lot of time, these three groups completely just left each other alone. There was no overlap. Just everybody said, oh, we'll stay here. We're happy here. We competed with these people. These people said, oh, we're here. We competed with these people. We said, we're here. We'll just let all the WhatsApp startups go and use us, right? There was no overlap. But that changed. And what happened was this group here and the technology they were using waged war on this group here. They basically said, if someone here can make money serving someone at 20 cents a year, and Oracle's out there charging someone a thousand bucks a year for their ERP license, gosh, imagine if I could go in and serve that same person for 20 cents a year, right? What do I have to do? I have to make it so that I use this model to sell these solutions. So what ended up happening was they introduced that model, software as a service, in there. And they went out and said, you know what, I'm gonna offer you the exact same thing that you have, but I'm gonna get rid of the need to buy computers and put them in a data center, I'm gonna need the you don't have to install all that software. And the big trick is you don't have to upgrade and maintain that software. I'm gonna take all that away from you. And everyone's like, oh, go ahead, try that. So really, I mean, the big story about this is Salesforce.com and Mark Benioff. So he actually was at Oracle and said, wow, look at this model. This is insane. I go out and call on this customer, and they spend millions of dollars 
going out to Accenture or Tata, upgrading their systems, buying data centers, and everything else. I'm going to offer them a solution and say, go ahead. I'm going to host your stuff. You log into a browser. I'll handle all of it for you. What did the customer say to them? They said, you've got to be kidding me. There's no way I'm doing that. So they went out to all those Oracle customers. They said, you're nuts. I would never in a million years do that. So you're telling me you handle the computer. So if the computers go down now, we don't have an ERP system. right? So I don't get to control my computers anymore. And on your hard drive, you have all of my financial data. You're nuts. I mean, that's laughable. There's no way that's happening, right? It's like giving the guy on the corner the house key to your house, right? They're like, there's no way that's going to happen. So he said, well, I believe in this model. It's going to work, right? All of the big people just slammed their door on him. So who did he go to? He went to small companies who couldn't afford those big systems. And he went to new companies. So a new company who doesn't have a data center and doesn't have an IT department, when they say, oh, I need a financial system or an HR system, they now say, oh my god, do I want to go buy a data center? Do I want to go buy $20,000 worth of computer? Do I want to hire an IT person? He walked in and said, don't. You've got 20 people at your firm? Just open up your browser and do it. Don't buy computers. Don't try and learn IT. Don't try and do that. Right? All the big people who already had it said, we already know how to do it. So what happened is they actually went through and he went to the small businesses and he went to the high tech companies who were saying, well, we also believe in this model. Right? So the Googles and the Facebooks and those guys said, oh, wow, we actually believe in this. We may as well do what we preach. Right? So now we come through and we have these slides that say 50% of people say we're fine going to the cloud. Right? When Salesforce started out, 99.9% .9 of people say, there's no way I'm ever going to the cloud. So now it's just accepted, right? I just checked into my room last night with a key on my phone. I never went to the front desk, right? I mean, if I told my grandmother that, she'd be like, what? I don't. She wouldn't understand it in, in any way, shape, or form, right? And then if I told her, well, what, now you should just open your door with a key like that. She'd be like, no, like, she, it just wouldn't even comprehend, right? But now it's just fully accepted. Right? I mean, I remember when I could get my boarding pass on my phone for my flights. I remember I was like, oh my god, if my phone dies on battery, like, I won't have one. So I, for years, I printed out and I had both ready like, to go. I, I was like, oh my god, right? And now the idea of like, printing out a boarding pass is just crazy, right? But it happened. So now, what we all say is taken for granted. It wasn't taken for granted. I mean, the reason Mark Benioff and Salesforce.com are worth $65 billion today is because they did the hard work of over 20 years convincing people that this model is better and it's going to be OK. And now, it's really hard to catch up. So if you look at this, a lot of these companies out there, the SAPs and the Oracles, are really trying to figure out how do we migrate, how do we compete in this? Because they have a whole bunch of people who have these big installs and they've got to go forward. So this is kind of what happened. And while this war is going on over the last 15 years, in our industry, we were like a little village out there. We were still churning butter. We were still tending the cows. We didn't even know this war was going on. We were completely oblivious to this war. Had no idea what was going on, right? So now what happens is we go through and say, well, OK, perfect. I'm trying to figure out where my slides are. So we go through and we say, OK, well, if this is going on, are we just going to offer the SaaS solution to our industry? Are we going to get all the same solutions that we have on-prem and just turn them into SaaS, like Mark Benioff did, and take over the world? And the answer to that would be, yes, that would be great. The problem is, we are still in day one. None of the people who buy our software have ever gone to the cloud. They have never been offered a SaaS offering. We would have to do all that same work of going in there and convincing them to go in and do this, right? So it's not going to be easy. We could offer them that, but then we have to do all the work of evangelizing and changing the mindset of a whole group of people who have never experienced this. So that would be one thing that we have to do. But the second thing that's happened is IOTs come in at the exact same time. So now we have these two different technologies that are coming in and are changing the way industrial assets work. So SaaS is a different way to deliver software. So you can just offer the same products that are hosted, making the total cost of ownership way less, but then there's also IoT, which is changing things drastically. So I'll kind of show you what we did. So we basically said, you know what? We're not going to try and become the next Facebook or WhatsApp or any of those things, right? What we want to do is we just want to become really good at software that connects to industrial assets. So we put a blinders around what we want to do. We just want to get really good at talking to airplane engines. We want to use digital technology to design and build them better. 
We want to have digital technology that helps people operate them better, so to take off at exactly the right angle. And we want to be able to have digital technology that helps us maintain those assets. So for every $20 million airplane engine we sell, we actually have $80 million of services over the lifetime of that. The oil changes, the repairs, all of that. So really, this is where a lot of our money comes from, is actually going through and figuring that stuff out. So we basically just want to make software that can make that whole life cycle better. Design, operate, and actually maintain all these assets by getting data from the assets. So now if we look at it, what's kind of changed here is these first two sections are about what IoT is doing to us, and then the second two sections are about what SaaS is doing to us. So what we have is right now, in our current system, we have really expensive sensors. And the way I kind of explain this to people is, if somebody goes in and says, you know what, I'm changing, and I'm gonna add a, a dining room table into my living room. And you go get an electrician and say, I need a new light switch and then a new light bulb over this new dining room table, right? The electrician says, you know, that'll be 1,200 bucks. You say, well, I know the light switch is five bucks, and I know the light bulb is five bucks, like why is it 1,200 bucks, right? He says, yeah, you're right about that. It's the fact I gotta pull a wire through all of the beams in your house up to that section, and then I've gotta refix the sheetrock, and then I've gotta repaint it, right? It's a $5 light bulb, it's a $5 light switch, but it's a $1,200 job. So to put sensors out in the industrial world is really expensive because you've got to pull power to them, and then you've also got to pull a network cable, like an ethernet cable to them, right? So people will say, oh, let's go put a million sensors out on the world. They go, it's really expensive, right? The sensor's not the problem. It's pulling the power and the network to it. So imagine now in that same example, if someone said, well, I'm gonna give you a light switch with double-sided tape on it that has a little battery in it that lasts 10 years, and I'm gonna give you an LED light bulb that has a battery in it that lasts 10 years, and now I'm just gonna stick that light switch on the wall, and I'm gonna stick the light bulb wherever you want it, when you turn on that light switch, that light bulb comes on. Now, instead of being $5 for the light switch and $5 for the light bulb, it's $10 for the light switch and $10 for the light bulb. It's now a $20 solution that used to be a $1,200 solution. It now takes three minutes to install it, whereas it used to take two weeks. That is really, really changing the world, right? So as people get into batteries and networking that's over wireless, it really changes how many sensors can be in there and how quickly you can proliferate this stuff. The next thing that happened is we used to have light bulbs and light switches and things that would measure the temperature, right? So we used to go through and if we wanted to put sensors out there, we had a couple choices, right? Now what people are doing is they're saying, well, with the cost of computing, we can actually start doing audio processing. We can start doing vision systems, right? So it used to be if you wanted to know if an engine was running in a train and you wanted to know what gear it was in and what the RPM of the engine was, I had to go get something that measured whether the engine was running. I had to go get a, vibe, a sensor that told me the RPM of the engine, right? And then I had to go in and actually go have a gear selector that would say for first, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, right? I had to do all of that. And if I had a train from GE, its engine was different. I had to put the sensors in that thing. And then if I got a train from Siemens, I had to go to another thing. Now someone's like, well, what if you just put an iPhone in the cockpit and you can hear when the engine started? And then I can actually just, by hearing it, I can actually figure out what speed it's running at. Just like when I put the gas pedal on my car. Right? I can actually figure out the speed just by processing that audio signal. And then if I can actually use that phone to tell me how fast I'm going and the speed of the RPM, I can now tell you what gear you're in. So now, rather than having to go out to a Siemens and a GE one and figure out how to put, are you running, what's your RPM, and what gear are you in sensors all over these different pieces of equipment, you can just say, now I have one solution. It's just listening to the stuff, and through smart analytics, I can tell you, am I running? What RPM am I at? And what gear am I at, right? Just by being smart with software. So this IoT stuff is coming in and really changing what our future looks like. The second stuff here is just the benefits of actually having SaaS software. So right now, we have a whole bunch of systems out there. Like, so in California, there's a bunch of oil refineries. I don't think they built a new oil refinery in California since 1972, right? These things are out there, they're permitted. You couldn't even get a permit for a new oil refinery in California, right? So what they do is they actually just run those plants, right? And in 1972, there were computers and computer systems. They're not building a whole bunch of new refineries. They just keep those things running, right? So what happens is they have a system out there that has Windows XP. That refinery is the same, right? 
So the only time they have to upgrade is when XP is now no longer secure. So now they go in and spend $500,000, $800,000 to have the exact same screen on Windows 10. They're saying, I don't need a new screen, and my refinery is the same. I need the exact same screen, but you're telling me to keep this stuff running, right? And to do a nice changeover, it's going to cost me 700,000 bucks just to go from XP to Windows 7. They say, yes. If this was a SaaS model, where all of this stuff was hosted, it was running on Linux, it doesn't have those upgrade migration cycles, they would just never have to do that. They could get rid of all of that pain and suffering, right? And then the other side of it is, right now, because we do have these small networks, right? We have a couple computers. As soon as you go to SaaS, you can actually go through and start doing all of that advanced, fancy noise processing or sound processing to tell you all that fancy stuff, right? So the answer is, is it as simple as the same thing that Salesforce did? The answer is it's not as simple for us, right? So we could go to just doing SaaS, that's true, but we also have IoT coming in. So all of these things merging together make this a really complex and dynamic space. All right, so GE says, okay, we want to become a great digital industrial company, right? Let's get started. So this is not my formatting. This is, it got shrunk. So that's why it looks a little funny. But so basically what we did is we started, as any big company would, our change. And luckily our CEO from the top up or top down said, we have to change. We have to do something different. We have to completely, instead of doing 4% new adoption of software a year, we got to do 25% new adoption of software a year. So at the annual meeting with all of the leaders of all these divisions, he said, 50% of his talk was on how we're going to become software focused, what we're going to do. And he said, every single one of you, when you go back this year, get better at software, hire data scientists, do everything else, right? And next year at your review, I'm going to talk to you about what you're doing with software. And he sent everyone home from the meeting. And at the next January or December, everyone came back in for their annual review. And what happened? Killing what? Killing field. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the killing field. But basically, the CEO of GE Healthcare, or GE Aviation, a $22 billion division, he comes in, he spends every year doing what he had done the year before, which is making sure that division was profitable and Delta Airlines was happy and their new product was released. And right before his meeting with the CEO, he goes, what did we do with software this year? And the guy says, oh, we did a big data lake and a artificial intelligence. He said, great. And he went into his review and said, here are my numbers. The guy said, that's great. And what did you do with software? Data lake and AI. Well, what, did it have any outcomes? How many people? Well, I think we hired three people. And it just didn't work. These people have jobs to do. They had businesses to run. We five minutes. So basically, he went through, he said, this is not working. Like, I try and have organic penetration in here, and these people have businesses to run. They have to keep the lights on, was the phrase, right? So this isn't working. So what he said is, I'm going to change what I'm going to do, is I'm going to create an R&D center, I'm going to put it in California. We're an East Coast company. I'm going to go out there and just hire 500 brand new people who have a software background and give them the ability to not have to listen to the other GE divisions and I'm going to have them come up with a software standard that we can all use. So he went out and hired people. He had a mandate. He said, do not hire from the other GE divisions. Hire new people from outside. And then he said, I will protect these people. They can go into the boardroom, even though they have no revenue, and sit next to someone who has a $22 billion revenue stream, and their voice will be heard. So he went out. They created a new standard, and they put it on. They said, here's our new standard. We all use Hadoop version 2.6. We all use Linux version this. We all use this, OpenStack. Everything else. Gave it to the GE business divisions. What happened? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they came back for their annual meeting. Did you guys do it? Well, we did a little bit of it, right? Not a lot, right? Again, they said, this is not enough. So what they did is they said, you know what? The problem is when we just create a standard, all of the divisions don't have time to actually set up their computers, stand it up, learn how to install it and everything else. So they said, the next thing we're going to do is they said, I now need this to happen because I see it's inevitable that I need it. And they said, we're actually going to go through and create a platform. So now what we did is we actually said, we're going to centrally not only give the standard, but we're going to stand it up. So now all of your users just have to log in to use it. If you need more computers, we buy the computers. If you need more space, we have the space. If you have more data going in, we will just maintain it. We're just dropping those barriers of entry for the other divisions to use it. So this is what we ended up doing. And this is now getting more penetration. Again, the next year he said, we still need to do more. And they actually said, you know what I'm going to do? 
I'm not going to allow the CIO for GE Aviation to sit in GVA, GE Aviation running a $22 billion business. I'm going to have a CIO for GE, and I'm going to get all of the different head CIOs, and I'm going to pull them under this GE digital umbrella, a separate business unit. So now the mantra actually flows from there out to the business units. So what we've been doing is that this is really hard. And for a big division and a big company like GE, it's next to impossible. So we've been doing more and more progressively harder pushes to get the adoption cycle there. So to say this is one pretty thing where we said, oh, kumbaya on a meeting, everyone saw the light, it's not that way. It's really, really, really hard. And what we've been doing is we're six years into a journey. So I wanted to kind of let you guys know what we decided to do and how we did it. I'll get to the technology a little bit, but I got a couple minutes. A couple minutes. So what we did is we said, you know what? And we had to learn all this the hard way. When we set up a platform, we actually went through and said, can we build our own data centers? We actually tried it for a while. We're like, holy cow, like there's a lot to know. Using open source stuff in your own data center, that's really, really hard. And when we do the stuff that we outsource to Amazon or to Google Cloud Platform, their stuff run 10 times faster at a tenth of the price. So we eventually said, you know what? We're just gonna go out and use Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, so we're gonna build something that can go on any of those data centers in case there's a big, we didn't wanna lock into one because if Amazon starts offering really good prices, we wanna be able to move to them. If Azure starts offering good prices, we wanna be able to move to them, right? So we want to have that flexibility. And then we said, is there a platform out there? I said, well, there are a lot of generic platforms that allow you to tie a whole bunch of computers together. So we went out and the guys from Pivotal are here. So we actually went out and used an open source platform called Cloud Foundry. And you could use this to create an e-commerce store. You could create this to do a whole bunch of things. But this is really what stitches a whole bunch of these computers and hard drives and these data centers together. And then where we actually started developing is only <clears throat> the stuff that has to do with connecting to machines. So that's really the special sauce we were building is the stuff that actually allows you to connect to machines, get that time series data, that sensor data in, build out asset models, and then actually run analytics against those asset models. That was a special sauce we built on top of somebody else's computers, somebody else's platform, we built that. And then we actually went through and now we're building solutions. So we're building solutions on how to maintain an asset. So how to get the data coming off an asset to figure out, is it healthy, is it not? If it's not healthy, what service does it need? And in what time frame does it need that service before it fails? And to figure that out just from the machine talking and then to be able to get the right person out there with the right parts at the right time, and get that whole loop figured out. So we're actually building those solutions that you can have, and then once we as GE Digital build this, we hand it off to the aviation people who twist it for airplane engines and the airlines. We hand it off to the healthcare system and they do it for the MRIs and the CAT scans. We pass it off to the mining companies and they do it for the copper mines, right? So this is the structure that we've built, and we're really building this and this as GE Digital, and then each of our divisions is consuming that and using it internally and then selling it to customers. And this is just kind of the last slide I want to go through, but basically here talking about the big benefits is what we had to do to get this adoption level up is we basically took all of this pain away from all of our users. They don't have to buy computers and put in OSs. They don't have to go buy databases. They don't have to put in the middleware. They don't have to worry about the security and the penetration testing or any of that stuff, right? We basically have all of these reusable services. And now when someone wants to build something that connects to machines and has that data, they just have to go in and focus on why is the data coming from that asset unique, right? And what does somebody who's running that asset need to see on that screen? So what we've done is through blood, sweat, and tears over a long time and a lot of failed starts, this is where we're at today. That's it? Nope, oh, question? I don't even know. One.